Right out then, folks. A good morning, folks. And a happy St. Patrick's Day to you all. Yes. And today, I am going to be speaking on the next bit of confectionery through the ages and in my youth, which we're getting on to in a moment. So to start with, La -de -da -de -da -de -da. Workers in the sweet industry, especially the lucky enough ones to work for round trees, fries, cadbury's, and Mars, were better looked after than many, as well as them paying sickness benefit. They had health visitors who would come to your house, which is Pretty, pretty good, I think, you know, in, in, in that in that respect. But the next bit is a little more the less. Fry's Christmas tree to Bristol poor children with thousands of toys for the boys and thousands of dolls for the girls. But kindness and good intentions could not protect workers for everything. Industry was industry, and even the most comparative innocuous word of confectionery evolved tasks brought with hazards. Skin diseases were rife. Grosser's itch, or more formally known as sugar dermatitis, was a common ailment. For those who spent all their day peeling oranges and lemons, the crow's effect, effect of citric acid was bad enough, especially on a cut or a saw. But it was, it was worse. There was a mold found in some peels and buried itself into the fingernails, building up infections, which could be very, very painful. Ice cream makers, on the other hand, had no need for manicures, Constantly use of ice and salt stunned mayo growth. But the bad bit was, as factories grew bigger, they must have been very careful for the build-up of dust from the cocoa, starch and sugars. As if it ignited, whoosh, the factory was no more. Advertising started to become a big thing. Who remembers the fox in Fox's Glacia Mints? It was. No? Yes? Ah, at least a couple of people. Thank you, thank you very glad. <laughs> and now I go on to the next bit. Which is uh, da -de -da -de -de. excuse me from the middle by the by the mid nineteen thirties, Britain's chocolate firms employed eighty thousand of their own cows and used fifty million gallons of milk a year. You can't carry a glass of half a, uh, glass and a half of milk in your pocket, as the advert went for Cadbury's dairy milk. Between 1933 and to 38, Roundtree's spent £227,000 which is about, I, can't, I, I looked at this, and it calculated about half a million quid. Advertising black magic. That box. Which, sold, which they sold 3.5 million boxes of black magic chocolates. That's a heck of a lot of chocolate. 
I think you would agree. Right then. Two months before VE Day in 1945, a goods train pulled out of the sidings at Cadbury's Bourneville factory. Forty brown wagons were packed with chocolate, which was 35,840,000 two-ounce bars in it, on their way to the Allied forces in Europe, intended as handouts for starving, war-weary civilians. These bars were merely a quarter of the 90,000 ordered by the Ministry of Food. The amusing part about that is, uh, a slight aside, is that within the First World War, tins of chocolates were sent to the uh, people in the trenches who kept them. Uh, they went they went off, some melted, and afterwards it was found that a lot of these tins were found in houses when the houses were being cleared out. So you had these tins of chocolates which had been brought back for families and this type of thing, you know. The tins were okay, but the chocolate inside, that's a bit there. So the, it's how people collect things. And, you know, it's, it's part of this whole idea of sweets is still very much part of that. In 1952 came the end of rationing and the Queen's coronation. So sweets were very big within that time. A Scotch firm gave away 8,000 of sweets to children and to school children. Hmm. Of course, within sweets, one must mention ice cream and ice shows. Big treat back when I was quite young, I think, to all of us here, that they, they would have been a, a, a big treat. One of those that I do remember with endearing passion was from Lion's Maid, and it was called a Mibby. Oh, blimey, do I remember that. It was it was jolly good. It was really a, big, a very big treat, though, you know, and... Um, and also, because we didn't have a fridge or things like that, it was brought and it had to be eaten then. But there's one thing I do remember at home as a big thing, because it's very a Neapolitan ice cream. Anyone remember that? Yeah, it was it was absolutely lovely because it was different. It was something that you know, was an enormous treat, and I remember it well. Turn to the page. And also, when you were young, do you remember the sound of green sleeves? The chime of the ice cream van as it came up the road. And you plagued your parents if you were if you were my family, so you could go out and get an ice cream with the ice cream van. Uh, they were kind of there's a couple I remember quite well. One of them was called Mr. Softy, and the other was Mr. Whippy. Uh, they, they, I remember them with with quite good. And that was where, and if you were come from a very wealthy family, and about that time, you had a ninety nine, which was the, the the ice cream with a chocolate thingy in it. 
yes, yes. But you had to be quite, quite wealthy to, to be able to afford such things. But here's a, another little aside. Who was the famous politician who helped in the university team to develop the sort of ice cream which the whippies and the people sold in their vans? Who do you think that was? Does anybody have a guess at it? Yeah. Mrs. Thatcher. That's the lady in time. That's the lady. That was one of her things that I'm sure that Angela was nodding along happy there as well. <laughs> yes, we, we, we all remember that one. She put more water in so that there was less nutrition. Not that yeah. there was much nutrition, but she added water for the masses. Mm. Now, I come to say a few words about another thing, which was part of my family's life and part of, uh, but part of mine because I hated it, not mine because I hated it. And that was chewing gum. I didn't like chewing gum at all. You know, so maybe that was because by that by the time that chewing gum come out. I had had a disease in my gums, so I had my teeth removed. So chewing gum, you tried chewing gum with false teeth, not a lot of fun. <laughs> but it's like I've never liked anyway or found any use for it. But it was used by my brothers and sisters and my family. The market for it was in your local sweet shop or in the uh, dispensers, which used to be on the streets outside. You'd see them quite often if you walked around, you know, the chewing gum dispensers. And they're usually Wrigley's because they kind of nearly dominated the market at that time, you know. So you see a lot of people gnawing away, especially it was the bane of school teachers who would see lots of children masticating in the class and get really cross about it. And I understand why they got cross about it, you know, because standing up in front of there because we're all in you know, rows facing the front type of thing. <laughs> a few people are secretly gnawing away, type of thing, you know, or sticking it somewhere and um, under the desk. Uh, at that time, if you looked under any of the desks, you'd see kind of lumps of <laughs> used to gum all over there. It was a disgusting habit and... Uh, Unfortunately, it is still being used. <laughs> but, of course, there was something which was a love within my family. And this was <clears throat> Turkish delight. It was loved by my mothers and my three sisters, who... They liked it very much. And secretly by my father, who would protest strongly if he was challenged by the family that he'd liked it and, uh, and had used to be an enormous joke that you know, father liked it as well as mother. So uh, it was. No, some of you do, don't like that. <laughs> the amusing, one of the amusing facts is that Turkish Delight in England was made in West Norwood in a factory. The firm of the, who made it was owned by a man with a lovely name. He was Mr. A.J. 
Papadapakilius. I think he might have been Turkish. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the, the, the big company which which uh, made it and sold it, you know, and it wasn't kind of, it didn't exotically come from the Orient, but down the road in West Norwood. Slightly less marketing joy from that. But as I grew up by the seaside, Eastbourne that is, one has to say a few words about sticks of rock. Because seaside and rock, they went together like fish and chips, you know, that type of thing. It was, it was that, that big. Most seasides had them. Blackpool, Margate, and Brighton. Had their name inside them. It was a big thing then. You, you, you went to the seaside, you had rock. You know, mm. were you were supposed to take a, a stick back for friends, weren't you? If, that was yeah, it. If that, that, that's great, allowed. <laughs> a great, great encouragement, you know. And yeah. I, remember, I remember it well. You know, mm. uh, uh, growing up there, there was there was that, and there were lots of other, as we were saying earlier, lots of other junk chocolate junk uh, sweets that were part of that. You know, and I also remember. Once at uh, my sister's quite a, liked quite a lot. It's a kind of a marshmallow thing, and it was shaped as a shrimp. Oh. It was quite <laughs> weird, yeah, but it was it was it was well liked in that type of thing. But also about that time, you had another couple of sweets which were liked within my family. Who remembers Love Hearts and Palmer Violets? Oh, Palmer Violets. Oh, and the Violets, I remember. <laughs> I can see I have a few people who would say, oh, yeah, I remember those. Um, Love Hearts were run by a firm which wanted quite good publicity. And in London, I was doing, at that time, I was doing street theatre. And we did street theatre, we were doing into children's, into little schools as well. You know, you do lots of little plays. And the, 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 the Love Heart Firm sponsored us for a while mm -hmm. to do this, to go around there and do things like that. And... Which, which which was great really because you know getting money from firms just to do that type of thing so we used to go around with these after we'd done the playlet and things like that or after we'd done the street theater bit we'd give out these streets they're, they're about these these sweets that's why I remember them so well you know they had things like you're my friend and other such uh, uh, things on it and I'm um, don't you know, but uh, uh, Patsy says she remembers Palmer Violets, and uh, that's my sisters like those as well. Because <laughs> but Of course, then there was the old standby, which we all knew about. Do you remember seeing an advert where a small boy stands at the window and he speaks down and says, Don't forget the fruit gums, Mum. Oh, yeah. <laughs> do you remember, do you know what happened to that child? Fell out of the window? <laughs> no, no, he's, he's very much alive and he's a famous actor. 
he he acted in Sweeney. He was Carter in Sweeney and Minder. It was a very useful Dennis Waterman. That was his first acting oh, role, <laughs> <laughs> which is quite quite amusing, I thought. Yeah. The... And now look over there, who's just rode into town? Why, it's a milky bar kid. <laughs> and this was a very big thing. Because you know, it was child actor, he had kids, it's the Milky Bar kid, Woo-hoo! and <laughs> things like this. And, uh, and this is where advertising started to get big on this type mm. of thing, you know, because if you had a few wrappers of this and you sent them a bit of cash away, you could buy a hat like the Milky Bar kid. And I remember a lot. That hats around the time that, that you buy that, and you could buy a jacket and this actor, a little person. You know, it was, it was kind of, it? but another aside coming up here. If the uh, Nestle decided they wanted to revisit this, so they did a big campaign for young lads to come forward to become the next Milky Bar Kid. And so, in the home of competition, a few small black lads decided that they wanted to become that, you know, and they decided that they could go to the audition. But Nestle said, with great harumphing, no, that couldn't happen. The Milky Bar Kid was blonde white child who advertised white chocolate. So how could they have a black child within this? This nearly went to trial until Nestle decided that they weren't going to have any children at the moment that they would revisit this in the future was a what like, what someone once called a squeaky bum moment <laughs> <laughs> but at this time the beatles were around and you might think that, what's that got to do with confectionery, right? Well, I'll tell you. George Harrison, foolish enough, let it be known that his favourite sweet was a jelly baby. He said later that this may have been a thing he shouldn't have said anything about. As he said afterwards, we're getting about two ton of them thrown at us every night. <laughs> mm. You can just imagine it, can't you? Sweeping up the stage afterwards, you know, and uh, <laughs> half a ton of jelly babies. <laughs> but of course, that wasn't just uh, them. Later on, in life in Doctor Who Tom Baker as a doctor said that he liked jelly babies as well you know so he got sent quite a lot as well <laughs> Oops. right I don't want to rush on and uh, uh, finish about half eleven because I think I'm going to do it uh, But anyway, the first ice lolly, which was marketed to 
actually girls, this one. Mm. It's made by Lion's Maid. Mm. And it was called Fab. And mm. the person who used to eat this was Lady Penelope from Thunderbirds. And this was advertised as a big thing, you know, that mm. kind of um, the first touch of feminism, yeah. even uh, in 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 that. Of course, ice cream vans started to actually decline at the start of supermarkets mm. uh, because basically people started to own fridges and freezers mm. and they could buy them from there and put them in there so the the whole idea of uh having this as a treat type of thing disappear 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 mm. Uh, and now we come to something which is uh, was an amusing thing with my family because it usually only happened at Christmas. And that was the liquor chocolates. Oh. These were something which was, again, the treat type of thing. Mm -hmm. But this, again, was spoken about in uh, the House of Commons because the MPs were starting to get across that children might be able to get hold of these and they could have them in a street in the youth clubs and things like this and all oh, terror would be set loose raging hordes upon the streets drunken on <laughs> on touches of cherry brandy and whiskey and such things in your sweets a terrible thing to happen <laughs> it didn't get very far though because Customers seem to like them in large amounts. They sold in thousands upon thousands of these, all exotic sweets with exotic things inside them. Mm. Mm. Anyone? Anyone remember them? Anyone had them? Which, the, the liquor chocolate? Mm. Oh, yeah, I thought they were divine. <laughs> and uh, I, I heard later that they didn't, there wasn't actually any alcohol in them at all. Is that, am I right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was all part of this, uh, this brain fuzz, you know, <laughs> that um, this is what you're having type of thing. And, and no, you weren't, as you, as you, as you probably guessed. Mm. Right. Now then, in 1966, the advertising people or the, the uh, sweet people decided that they would have a league table, basically, for sweets. And this is the one they produced in 1966. And I would be surprised if anybody doesn't recognize all of them. I've got for I go from one to to twenty. There was Mars bars, Cadbury's Dairy Milk, Wrigley Spearmint Gum, Milky Way, Polos, Kit Kat, Crunchy, Wrigley's Arrow Mint, Fruit Pastels, Maltesers, Smarties. Fruit Spangles, like them. Rolo, Bounty, Fruit Gums, Prize Chocolate Cream, the favourite of my mother. 
Trebo mints, opal fruits, flakes, and something called Bar Six. I'm not quite sure what that was, but it was the, the number 20 of that type of thing, you know. And as I said, I'd be surprised if any of you didn't recognize, they not recognize any of them because they were, you know, the kind of the big, the big things. Which, if you think about that, and if you look about that, you'll find that the small confectioner's days had gone. There wasn't one in the top 20 which wasn't made by a big company. Fries, Cadbury's, Wrigley's, Roundtree's. They were a big company. And as you can see from a lot of that, most of them were the chocolate Quaker Burns mm. who were making <laughs> a very good living. Thank you very much out of that. <laughs> Over there, you know, so next thing is something I remember awfully well, and it had an amusing connection to the the to the uh, the, the virus which we just had. Was growing up in the southeast, one of the pop drinks I remember was Corona. The coronavirus and the corona drink. Uh, I said, my brother and I were, were chatting about that a, a little while ago, you know, and how the, the amusing thing was, you know, that um, you know, the corona drink is affecting us all now in a virus, you know. That. Very silly, but we just laughed like mad about that. And uh, let me get where I am. Yes. One of the flav flavors, which there were many, you know, you had American ice cream, type the uh, uh, apple, orange, mm. you know, all different flavors. But one of them, hold me, hold me for a because I read it to read this bit, was called Dandelion Burdock. Yes. <laughs> I thought you might. <laughs> Could pop actually be made from such waste ground weeds? It's not a question that any of us have asked at that time. But I always wondered, each plant was already known separate for its medical uh, properties as a cure for various ills, such mm. as gallstones, scurvy and rashes. But their marriage as a catch-all cure is undated. Mm. Nor do we know who first had the idea of adding some fizz, but the decision helped this dog combo through the 20th century. The taste is an enduring one, mixed up as it is with classless childhood nostalgia. As well known to Snooty, snotty house tenants, as to the young ladies who lived in the large houses. The the uh, place called Rotherham. The thirsty people there were catered for by Haig's Pop Factory, where a certain MP had a summer job in his parents' factory, who went on to become MP William Haig. <laughs> His factory sold, his parents sold the factory many years later, you know, and invested the money in other more profitable things, I'm told. Something I didn't quite remember as a boy, and I'm sure 
maybe some of the other masculine chaps here remember it also. It's called Sweet Cigarettes. This strange thing that was made from icing sugar, gum arabic, and gelatine, mm. rolled into a long roll and chopped up to lengths. Mm. One of them, which after reading about it, I remembered very well, was called Junior Service. After the cigarettes called Senior Service, which were very popular around at that time. So as a young man, you would you would smoke just like your dad or your big brothers, you know, you had these type of things. So, whoa, get me type of thing. My father used to smoke a thing called woodbines, which were quite noxious stuff. Mm. But I remember them exceedingly well because I used to collect the cards which would go with mm. them. And you had albums full of cigarette cards type of thing. And you would trade them like a like people, like young lads of, of when I was a lot older had football cards which they traded. You know, mm. me and my friends would trade cigarette cards. So <laughs> it was quite, you know, not the thing to be done today. You know, cigarettes are mm. you know, not de regular anymore. No. Mm. Oh, yes. The next thing, it is not, I suppose, really confectionery, but it comes in that era. And that's the delightful things called crisps. Oh. I remember eating tons of them when I was young. They, they were the thing. Mm. For almost half a century, from 1920s until well into the 1960s, Crisps have been synonymous with Smith's, an unhealthy English name. Mm. There was perfect foil for the potatoes, gimmicky pretensions. After all, the idea had come from France. From Frank Smith, ex-manager of a wholesale grocer in London, invested £10,000 and set up Smith's Potato Crisps in a converted store behind Cricklewood's famous Crown Hotel. Despite some initial wariness from the British public, Smith's tuppany bags of crisps eventually caught on, and with a few years, he'd opened six more factories to cope with the demand. Mm -hmm. Six times the value of boiled potatoes, boosted the ad. All vitamins retained. <laughs> and at least anyone thought this was mere puffery. The words medical opinion was appended to long to chiver on the, the, the ditherers. Crisp. What a pleasant. A sensible integral part of a well-planned diet. <laughs> so there. <laughs> Salt in a twist of blue paper was added in 1922. <laughs> and for Frank, fortune smiled. <laughs> Do you remember Chris with the blue with the, 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 the blue yeah. uh, the blue salt? Yay! <laughs> I'm not that old, that you, you, you remember it as well. Yes. Yeah. Right.
Right. So <laughs> the things have changed somewhat mm. over the years. So in Scotland, I am told it came from first. But this is that the Mars bar, but the Mars bar covered in batter and fried. <laughs> you think of anything more horrible. <laughs> but apparently this was tried and a lot of people liked it. No, no, who not for me, I guess. <laughs> but also, and this is something for those of a delicate nature. Perhaps you don't remember what some movie stars were alleged to have done with a Mars bar. X-rated, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and an amusement is that you remember adverts, they were on the cinema and they were on the telly, if one had a telly and type of things like this, was the black magic man in yeah. black who would suddenly appear at your bedroom door and leave chocolates. Can you imagine that today? <laughs> Some man in black suddenly appearing at your at your bedroom with chocolates. That's a stranger. <laughs> if it had, if he'd done that to my sister, he wouldn't have been able to walk for a week. <laughs> you know, things change, times change, and we have a whole different idea of what what what's going on. Yeah. Right. Uh, I'll be right with you. Let's find a bit. Right. Quite. Uh, cook, uh, uh, cookery programs of which the 90s folk seem obsessively fond really touch on the subject of confectionery, as if scared of challenging the sugar wizards in case they take offence and withdraw their flavours. Perhaps such practices would seem as a mark of poverty rather than make one, like waking one's own clothes. We feel rich enough to pay for our own confectionery or for the convenience of it rather than waste their time making misshapened attempts at wine gums or marshmallows. Or is it more complicated than that, more deep-seated, tanged with psychological imperatives? Mm. We expect, or are always brought up to expect, confectionery to be provided, mm. whether it's from our parents, friends or lovers. It has to be a gift, a sign of affection. Mm -hmm. But even when we buy it for ourselves as a self-indulgent treat, we expect it to be handy, pre-packed, pre-chosen. Though many of us will see this creative in confectionery peeling back decades on, it would be foolish to predict that it comes to a dead end. In their heyday, Fry's, Cabris and Round Trees might have launched about 20 or 30 new lines each and every year, mm. profligate, which is now viewed with disdain. Big business, serious money, league tables, confectionery employs 50,000 people, from factory girls to grown men who sweat it out in hotel conference suites. No pun intended. Pencil in ready, trying to look seriously as they discuss the discuss the thickness of chocolate bars and the thickness the thickness of those willing to pay through the nose for them. 
Compromise is a key word. And the most recent examples is Capri's Fuse. Heard of it? Nestle's Maverick. A perfect example of those designed by the committee which didn't work. Every minority group must have its say the crunches, the snickers, the nibblers, the fruit freaks, and the nut bars. <coughs> Not to mention the human pelicans who can swallow one hole. Willy Wonka and his team had nothing on them. The talk is the talk is not for sweeties and love, but for units, convergence, sales, throughput. Never mind converting the kids. First, you had to sell the idea to the bankers, the shareholders, and for that kind of high level salesmanship, fancy language is predominant. Mm. The prerequisite. Strollers are not just packed the sweets, or no. They're designed to offer adults functional food. 19th century language, though quaint and elaborate by today's standards, did at least possess some degree of clarity. Modern marking, speaker analysis, is virtually meaningless. Mm. Can we go on forever? There are only so many flavours and limited number of textures and so many combinations of each. Doubtless, the future will yield sweet horrors of its own <laughs> with genetic manipulation as we might get flavours that don't exist in the natural diet. With, with, the possibilities are endless, but with all the profits at stake, food and confectionery scientists are no doubt already busy with their test tubes and their mouth coats. <laughs> and there you are, my friends. That is where my research ends. <laughs> any any um, stories? of your own sweet likings, dislikings. Um, mm. I still that, 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 Mary. I've got such a vivid memory in 1945 of the long, long queues waiting for ice creams. Mm -hmm. that the local shop had got in. And there were tiny little spheres wrapped in a bit of paper. Do you remember? Oh, yes. No, no I don't remember 45 because I wasn't born. <laughs> <laughs> ah. <laughs> and I also remember from the age of about five going on a Sunday to buy a crunchy bar with my father. Oh, yes. They don't taste the same now. No, but I do, I found that, yes. The, the crunches taste different. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think my memory of the sweet is in the past, that say like a Mars bar. Um, mm. My sister and I had half a one. And, mm. you know, you could actually deconstruct. You can save the best bits or last. The best bit for me was the, the thick... Um, chopped it on the top, and then there was a runny bit, and then there was the, the mark, you know, the, the, the Malteser bit, and actually really sitting and enjo enjoying, and I think my sister used to keep it until, yeah. you know, everyone in the family had eaten their sweeties, and then she would sit and eat it after tea in <laughs> front of us, because that's the sort of child she was. But I do think, I think, I don't really have sweeties now, but I think then each part had a dis of a Mars bar had a distinct texture and it's a distinct taste. And that taste wasn't just sugar. Yeah. But now I think they all taste far too sweet to me. Mm. Yeah. 
the made in the made in factories, you know, but uh, uh, by the thousands and thousands now. You know, there's there, there's a there's kind of a different re recipe and all that lot to you know, and, uh, um I remember, uh, I suppose, one of my favourite things I found them a few years ago as well was um, flying saucers. The little uh, sugar paper with yeah. uh, sour mm. stuff inside it, mm. and popped rice with mm. all different colours on it. Mm. Oh yes. yes, I remember going when on my way to school. We had I had a penny, which <laughs> we used to go to this tiny sweet shop run by this little old lady, and we thought she must have been, you know. Very, very old, you know, 80, 90, and she's probably only about the 40 or 50, you know, then. But to, to us, she was very old. Mm. And we had this paper cone, which was filled with this ricey mm. type of thing, which had lots of colors on it. Mm. And we'd go to school oh. with that. And that is an abiding memory with me. And I found them in one of these new. You know, sweet shops which have all the jars and all this yeah. like, they they lasted for a little while. I don't think any of them are around again now, but I found them in there and they had this rice. And I said, to my friend, my brother, and said, you found some bloody blah. And he went, No, you haven't. <laughs> <laughs> so, Nick, so Nicholas so Market's got sweet jars, right? Yeah. Sorry, I've interrupted. No, that's it. No, no, no. I, I, I shall investigate it and see if they got what I like. What I like. But, uh, there I'm you go. trying to remember if there's one on Gloucester Road as well. Um, oh, there is a sweetie shop on the Gloucester Road. Yeah. As you go down the hill, it's on the left hand side. I don't know what they sell, but they do seem to have a large selection in jars. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Do D yeah. Graham, David, do you remember your sweets of your boyhoods? Yes, I. One of the changes in my uh, habits of eating confectionery concerned Kit Kat, which I used to enjoy, mm. and then the firm manufacturing it was taken over by Nestle at the time Ooh, of yes. the baby milk scandal. Yeah, yeah, I remember and it well. Boycott was introduced of all. Nestle goods. Well, now Nestle is such a vast firm, uh, multinational company dealing with food and other things. It's very difficult to actually put that boycott into practice. But I stopped eating Kit Kat at that time and have never consciously eaten a piece of Kit Kat since then. And it gives me a little glow of self-righteousness, but uh, <laughs> it's totally ineffective, of course. The other thing I wanted to mention was the loss of what many would consider one of Bristol's architectural gems, which was the Smith's Crisp factory on the junction of Bath Road and Stockwood Lane. This is out in the wilds of mm. southeast Bristol which many of you probably not familiar with, but on that corner, there used to be a very striking art deco factory churning out bags of Smith's crisps. And I don't remember any protest, but there certainly ought to have been when it was demolished and is now replaced with one of dozens of firms refurbishing cars and selling new ones and so on. A loss, an architectural loss for Bristol. The Smiths were challenged quite a few years ago by the income of a American firm called Golden Wonder, which uh, you know was a big, was a big challenge to them. But the yeah. Chris factories, the Chris company uh smith's is still going i don't know if it's it's probably owned by a multinational now no doubt mm. but uh like most like most of the uh tweet firms and the uh uh other confectionery lined firms you know they're they're 
they're all they're all being sold to be sold to be sold you know even as we know all the chocolate factories the the, the fries and the round trees and the cadbury's and all this lot have now gone you know, owned by different firms mm -hmm. uh, uh, christopher you like a bit of chocolate don't you Yes, I'm not allowed not allowed to eat it so much anymore. So um, I've had to go on to the. I mean, I've always liked dark cho chocolate, but I now eat the eighty five percent ones. Um, but um, never mind. Um, I don't think you mentioned chalk ices, but they were very sophisticated when oh. I was young. <laughs> Um, no rest. Uh, yes. Uh, well, you've made me feel very hungry this morning, Ray. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it took a little while compound, compiling all this together, you know, but uh, mm. I'm glad I did because I found mm. out a few things that I didn't remember, you know, and, uh, mm. especially about Dennis yeah. Waterman. <laughs> David, you're muted, David. I'm muted. I was muted. I grew up by the seaside, and um, so a lot of my uh, childhood memories of uh, sweets and confectionery are from ice cream parlours, uh, often run by uh, local local Italian families. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, and so, uh, so you know, it would be locally made ice cream that made it a little bit more special. And um, you know, as as I grew older, I, I had a buddy who was a market. I, I worked for Procter and Gamble, and marketing people from Procter and Gamble would typically um, train at Procter and Gamble and then get a job at either Mars or Pet Foods. That was the most common place. So um, you could see that marketing was coming into uh, confectionery. And, and Mars was an American company, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, later on, I had a friend who um, uh, worked for Mars as a training manager. And he said that Forest Mars had come over from America and announced that the, you know, the goal was to increase sales of Mars bars by 20%. And they... They did it just by making the bars 20% bigger, you know, and charging 20% more for them. So sometimes marketing tactics were fairly simple. And, um, you know, the, the, the other thing that um, uh, becomes more topical is that, uh, of course, there, there are a lot of Quaker confectionery companies. And uh, having read with interest about the, the history of Quakers and their involvement uh, with chocolates. So most of them ended up um, with, it was the second generation in the family or the third generation in the family wanted to take some of the, the ill-gotten gains and or sweet-gotten gains and, <laughs> and do something else with them. And that caused the families to consider um, turning themselves into a limited company so they could liberate some cash. And then they find themselves uh, owned by the markets and bought out by other companies and manipulated. Yeah. And um, I think that's a sort of, um, it's almost a, like a collective mistake that the Quakers made. And I think, you know, well, why didn't the Quakers uh, have a connection with the um, cooperative movement? And instead of selling mm. off, becoming... Uh, PLCs and limited companies, why didn't they turn their businesses into true worker co-ops? Mm. I think there's a missed opportunity there. There was a chocolate <coughs> that I have just remembered which was given especially to my sister who liked chocolate. And that's the one I think you all remember. Toberone? Yeah. Oh. The, 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 yeah. The, the, uh, the ones yeah. of uh, yeah. the, 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 the pyramid things. 
uh, I remember that I wrote that very well as well. You know, on the subject of uh, chocolate, uh, chocolate David and the Quaker firms, I think the fact that. Uh, as you said, the, the 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 more younger came into it and wanted to do things. So it was more uh, because the sons and all that were then educated, university educated, and just didn't go into the business. So mm -hmm. they became one removed from the workers and the, the that type of thing, you know, and and maybe they felt they was a little more above the hoi polloi type of thing, rather mm -hmm. than the 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 people like Cadbury's who made, you know, uh uh Bournefield mm -hmm. and the fries in mm -hmm. Bristol who had the, it's got their workers out into uh, Canesham and places like that. Mm. They were the kind of nearly the first generation, and the second generation were didn't go into the firm, but they went to universities first, so they felt kind of above that. And I think mm. that might have been the reason for the disconnect. Mm. Mm. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway, um, yes. Any more chocolate dreams or or um, fruit fruit gum dreams that to you can Tough toffees, Ray. You didn't mention toffees at toffees. all. Toffees. Yes. No, no. That that's a thing which I which I didn't didn't come across really. You know, the the, the, the people like Bryant and May mm. made mm. a lot of those, you know, and. Um, and I can't think of another firm, but then Bright May made quite a lot of them, you know, and biscuits. Mm. I could have gone off on a tangent and told you about biscuits because that's a whole new other thing, you know. Because uh, yeah. uh, one of the big business makers was a Quaker. Who could that be, I ask you? <laughs> I think it's Huntley and Palmer. Save it for another time. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Graham was right there. It's Huntley and Palmer. Yeah. <laughs> that's a whole that's a that's a whole new you know, biscuits or a whole a whole other thing, you know, how they're made and who they made them, you know, kind of uh bath olivers and that type of stuff, you know, which was mm -hmm. obviously made in bath. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway. As someone said, that's something which maybe for another time. Anyway, I think we I I think we ought to thank you very much, Ray, because you've done all, all the work today. And, uh, thank, thank you very much. <laughs> I enjoyed it. Really interesting. Yeah, thank you. So it's it part. Good. It's part of being, being a being a showman. I enjoy those type of things. <laughs> anyway, I have to say, where am I? That's me. Oh, next week, there is a rare treat for you, my friends. Oh. Beside us sits a Patsy who will be giving the talk next week. And her title is Early Teaching Attempts, Learning on the Job. Perhaps not for those who have a background in education, because really it's very bad news <laughs> for teacher training at that era. <laughs> really awful. Well, we wow. look forward with interest, Patsy. Yeah. Thank so, you. So, today, many thanks for attending. And Thank you. Thank you very much. You Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.